Hello and welcome to No Apologies on Beck, where we are unafraid to speak the truth. I am your host, Rick Becker, our co-host, Lori Hintz. Thank you How very are much. You I'm, I'm good. I'm frantic and I'm, rushed no, and there's, crazed. No, there's no reason to be. We've got it all under control We're here. We're good. Okay. First thing we're going to talk about, topic number one, numero uno tonight, is what recently happened with the uh, bars mm -hmm. and restaurants EO, as in executive order, that was just, just came down last night. In fact, probably while we were doing the show, yes. the news kind of broke on it. So Right. So there, this is an interesting thing, and I think we need to break it down. So okay. Last night, shortly before 7 p.m., Governor Burgum tweets out that he's lifting the curfew for bars and restaurants, the 10 o'clock curfew, we call it. Um, the 50% capacity restriction is still in place, the masking, the social distancing, all that's still in place until the 8th, masking until the, I think, 18th or 19th. Right. What I am confused about is why did he lift the mandate? Because people are saying, well, thank you, Governor Burgum, for lifting that. Because uh, in, in Governor Burgum's words, uh, he said that the uh, businesses are an important part of our economy and we are deeply grateful for their efforts and sacrifices to help slow the spread of COVID-19 and reduce active cases and hospitalizations. Okay, this is what he said last night. All right. Previously on this show, you and I spoke about how it was very interesting on the 16th, December 16th, mm -hmm. only less than a week ago. Right. Governor Burgum came out, they talked about vaccinations, and they talked about the fact that hospitalizations were going down. What was concerning to me is they discussed how the number of hospitalized people dropped by 146, and that 74 out of those 146 <laughs> had left the hospital sometime within the two previous weeks. Two previous weeks. Right. That's not, that's not all, this, the, the other 72 people left sometime before December 1st. Right. So the hospitalizations had gone down dramatically prior to them even being aware of it. And when they became aware of it, it was on December 16th. On December 16th, the number of hospitalizations was 156, I believe. And the number of hospitalizations yesterday was 135. So, you know, it continues to taper down. Right. Not dramatically different, okay? The vaccine was available on the 16th. Hospitalizations had plummeted before, but were finally recognized on the 16th. Mm -hmm. What happened? What's different? Okay. <laughs> I, I could guess. Do you want me to guess? Yeah, please do. Go I ahead. think there was probably uh, the potential for some people saying things about it publicly. And I think there were some bar owners and restaurant owners who decided mm -hmm. that's it. We need to save our businesses. We need to get together and work on some strategies. Exactly. So I, I think you're exactly right. Now, <clears throat> I think that people like us on this show are relaying to North Dakota citizens the importance of uh, a healthy economy and how these mandates hurt that in addition to hurting us psychologically, mentally, morally, et cetera. It, it, they hurt in so many ways, which is why we bring up the videos from various bar owners and how they're trying to support their families. Uh, our, our next guest is actually going to be someone who's in this fight and who helped bring attention to the problem and not only bring attention to it, but to actually do something about it. Well, that's the, that's the rub right there, is that people are starting to realize, hey, we need to do something about this and we're going to have to get active and we're going to have to get vocal because I think the lesson that was learned was when there was uh, a group of parents who got very vocal about having sports for their children and they were very vocal mm -hmm. and there were changes made shortly after that. Yes. Yeah, and we talked about that in one of the previous shows that if the science was there for the mandate to support it, that there should be no high school sports, no practices, but when enough parents and enough legislators complain, they pull back on it, you have to ask yourself, where's the science? Where's the science? Because <laughs> if it was important, if the science supported it, you wouldn't pull back simply because it was unpopular. Exactly. At least I would hope not. Unpopular is the important word in that phrase, if you exactly. ask me. So. so what has happened in the meantime? You and I have shown the, the videos of the, of the fat fish people in Dickinson, right. of the Esquire Club gentleman in Dickinson. Right. We've talked about others. Uh, we have our next guest. There have been uh, city commissioners and county commissioners that are starting to 
become more vocal and starting to take action. Uh, on Sunday, in front of a large group of people gathering, which were bar owners, right. essentially, and others, but there, there, there was a large gathering of bar owners where we were discussing what it is that we were going to do. Mm -hmm. At that meeting, uh, a, a lawsuit, pending lawsuit, was brought up. That lawsuit was going to be dropped, it was announced, uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay? Because Governor timing. Burgum clearly, right. clearly uh, exceeded his authority. He clearly is acting like a legislature rather than ex an executive uh, uh, branch, uh, the head of the executive branch. And so that's a very interesting fact. That is. Burgum's office is made aware that there is going to be a lawsuit dropped, which he knows he will lose on Tuesday or Wednesday. Additionally, those bar owners, we discussed things and we agreed, we've had enough, we're all gonna be open. We had, we had uh, you know, there was more discussion on exactly which date, but it was coming up. Mm -hmm. And that was relayed to the governor's office as well. Hence you have a meeting on Sunday. Right. Word gets to the governor's office. I was contacted by the press on Monday morning. Right. Sunday night, no, no pre-recorded, uh, professional-looking tape like he did when he did the mandates. No usual presser, his one-and-a-half-hour, two-hour pressers that he has uh, routinely scheduled. A tweet, and then his, his uh, press guy putting out a press release at about 7 p.m. Monday night. Monday night. That the curfews pulled back mm -hmm. Tuesday. So... Basically, I don't think it's coincidence. It's not coincidence. <laughs> Burgum caved, and he knew the writing was on the wall. And what he did, like any tyrant, is he pushed things as far as he could. He exceeded power. He grabbed it where he could. And until people were going to fight back, he was going to keep pulling. Yeah. And I am hearing people saying, thank you, Governor Burgum. Thank you, Governor Burgum. Yeah, I'm happy that they're lifted. Mm -hmm. But here, here's what I liken it to. If I was walking down a street, and some guy grabs me, punches me to the ground, and stands on my head, when he finally lifts his foot from my head, am I going to say, oh, thank, thank you. you, thank you. No, I'm not, and that's what Governor Burgum did. That's, that's what he did, put his, his foot on the throat of our economy, of the business owners, of the employees of the hospitality industry. Now that he lifted his foot off, I say shame on you, Governor Burgum, because he, it has to be known that this is likely to happen again. He has to be held accountable, and there is no thank you coming from me. That's it. Okay, and you even get an early rant. Yay! That's a rant. So, all right. Now, going into our next segment, we will yes. be talking to somebody. This dovetails perfectly like it's all planned. Uh, we will talking to a, be talking to a gentleman who is a New Salem City Commissioner and what's going on in his city when we come back. Beck News brings you real people and real news. Every weekday on KNDB, KNDM, and KRDK. Start your evening with the Dr. Duke Show at 4. Take a fresh look at current events with ladies of another view at 4.30. Go down the road with Joel at 5.30. Watch No Apologies with Becker at 9. Cap off your night with No Filter with Debbie at 10. Beck News. Real people, real news. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink for trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. 
Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. For the greatest selection and full menu offering is the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfast served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street, Garrison. Some things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. Welcome back to No Apologies on Beck. We've got a really exceptional guest with us tonight. Perrin Getzfrit is a New Salem City Commissioner. And, you know, we talked about heroes, and I think, I think Perrin and the City Commissioners in New Salem are heroes mm -hmm. in, in my book. So, Perrin, thanks for coming on. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Appreciate yep. you very much. Um, to start off with, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, and we're going to get right into some of the things that have been happening in New Salem. Sure. Yeah, I'm a, um, I'm a contractor in New Salem, kind of in the area. Um, 24 years old, I guess. That's pretty young for being a city commissioner. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your dad's on city commission? Yep. Yeah, he is, too. So you guys, you, you just need, how many are on city commission? Five? Six. Six? Yep. Okay, so you need to get two well, to get your way. Is there a tiebreaker? It's, uh, yeah, the mayor is a tiebreaker if oh. there's a tie. Okay, so it's, you, just, you just need to get one more, and then you can, the city is your <laughs> dominion. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right? Right, right. I don't know if that's how that works, but, you know. <laughs> okay. So how long have you been a commissioner? Is just it, a couple of years. Just a couple uh, of years. Uh, mm -hmm. two, two years. Gotcha. All right, so it's very interesting. Uh, I t had kind of teased it or referenced it on a couple of other shows, mm -hmm. uh, but you guys did something that I think uh, took a, a little bit of chutzpah or audacity because you recognized that there was an issue. There was a problem with regard to how Governor Burgum's mandates were affecting people of your area, right? Right. And so what, what kind of led you to th think about this as being a problem? Well, so when the whole, uh, the whole COVID thing started and I was hearing about it, I didn't really think too much of it because it was just like I'd hear it on the radio at work. Um, and then as things kept getting worse and there was more and more restrictions all over the whole country, then I really started paying more and more attention to it. Um, I guess uh, the whole uh, mask mandate and stuff like that wasn't really a surprise after we had the business closures and stuff in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was kind of one of those deals like, okay, well, that's not really surprising, I guess. But And at, at first, I just got really kind of irritated about it. And I was like, well, whatever, I guess, you know. But uh, then it got extended. And then I really got irritated. And it's like, well, what, what can I do about it? Mm -hmm. And at first, I thought, well, I can call my, my representatives and stuff. And it's like, okay, well, that's it only does so much. You make the calls, and that's good. But uh, then it just, like, just hit me, okay, well, I'm on city council. I can do something about it. Then I can present a motion to the city at our meeting, and um, mm -hmm. maybe at least in New Salem we can say, hey, you know what, we're not, it doesn't work for yeah. us. Yeah, that's fantastic to really be able to, to think about trying to take control in your, what, what area you can. Right. Because you're right, calling, calling legislators is important, so they recognize, you know, how their constituents are thinking. But, you know, a lot of times not a whole lot gets done. And so the the... The closer it is to the people, the more direct action there can be, which is why I think some of the most important voting you can do is for your city and county commissioners. Mm -hmm. I mean, th those are the people that affect you day 
by day by day, not necessarily the president 100%. Right. or congressman. Right. I agree. So, so you, you were fed up. You're like, this is bogus. I've had enough. I want to do something about it. I'm sit on city commission. I'm going to do what? What did, what did you end up? Well, at first, doing? it was just kind of an idea. Well, maybe we can just say, hey, we're not doing this in New Salem. Um, and then, you know, once you have an idea, you got to do your research and see what you can do, mm -hmm. you know. And so then started making phone calls to the city council members in town, or a few of them, see what their thoughts were. They seemed to be, you know, from what I understood, maybe in favor of it. So then I made more phone calls, and um, <clears throat> this is just kind of what seemed like the best idea that I found. Okay. So, so you, 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 I think you phrased it something about how you, this, you could just say no in the, in the city of New Salem. Right. But how do you go about saying no? Because... I'd like to say no, but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to get in trouble. Right. right. Um, well, my, the motion I presented was to, uh, to uh, amend our contract. We, we contract our policing through Morton County Sheriff's Department. Okay. You don't have city police? No. Okay. So uh, I just presented a motion to amend our contract with them to say um, the, uh, the executive orders related to the COVID-19 state of emergency are not to be enforced. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's not an exact wording of it, but sure. This is the well, and that's idea. brilliant. I mean, it that's is. a brilliant it's way to do it because you're not trying to say, uh, you're not trying to take it to court, make it complicated. You're mm -hmm. not trying to say it's an illegal executive order. You're just saying, hey, great, whatever the rest of the state, if you want to do this thing, but we don't want to do it, and so we're going to ask our law enforcement to not enforce those mandates. So you, how did that go then? I assume it passed. I know it passed. I you know, but did it? Was there a lot of back and forth. Yeah, it, um, it was probably the uh, second longest city council meeting I was at. Really? It, it lasted quite a while, but, um, you know, it, I don't want to speak for the other council members, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, yeah, it was, there was some debate to it, and, and it did pass in the end, so. Yeah. I had heard one of the concerns from one of the city commissioners was that it, it could mean that a lot of people would be coming to New Salem the bars. And I thought, well, that, that's a good thing. Um, you drive a little more economic activity. Unless they're coming to, then you have to deal with yeah. drunkenness. But I mean, otherwise, economic activity is, is a good idea. Yeah, I can't say that I would be sad if some people came to New Salem. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, really close to Bismarck Mandan for those of you watching who do not know that. <laughs> so. yep. um, but as far as a bunch of people coming out to town, it's, it's still up to the businesses you know, to be responsible sure. and do what, operate business in the way that they see fit, I guess, according to the circumstances. Okay. Have you heard anything from Morton County Sheriff's Department? I haven't. Um, usually, I, I don't deal with that stuff. It's, it mm -hmm. goes through the city then, and so um, I, I personally haven't heard you anything. You've not heard right anything. Now. As far as you're aware, have they received the motion to amend the contract? Uh, that part, I'm not sure if they have. Okay. That I don't know. All right. So this, uh, last night, Governor Burgum pulled back on the curfew. Mm -hmm. So in your mind, is that everything's honky-dory? Are you still, you still going to be pursuing mm -hmm. a, a change in your contract with the Sheriff's Department? I, I would assume that the city would still be, but... I, well, I, I suppose so. until someone makes a different motion, right. it has I, to I proceed. Think, I think so. I don't know. I... Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not sure exactly how all that stuff works. I guess, but yeah. Um, I, yeah. My my thought is it's a fantastic idea to continue moving forward on because if there aren't future executive orders with curfews, then great. There's n there's no problem. Right. But the second, you know, Great Britain. We were uh, Laurie and I were just talking uh, last night. Uh, the Great Britain has a new variant, a new mm -hmm. uh, mutation of the of the virus. Right. If that comes around, every, for, for every little peak, is he going to close down business? And so I think it's fantastic. I hope that you guys continue with it and plan to have it in your contract. I just think it was very brave. I think that was a yeah. really, it was a really good example for other grassroots people around the state in other municipalities or mm -hmm. cities to go and say, hey, this is where we start from this place, and it was really smart of you to go the route with non-enforcement because it's a lot easier to do it that way. That was just really, really 
brilliant. So kudos, kudos to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm proud of you guys. I, it, that type of thing makes me proud to live in North Dakota because there we have, I've always been one to say North Dakotans are, are sort of rugged individualists. We, mm -hmm. we say government, we can handle things ourselves wherever possible. And the fact that you guys stood up, I mean, we should have been hearing this type of thing all across the state. And, yeah. and as far as I know, you guys stood alone, and, and as Lori said, kudos to you. Fantastic. I hope that other people hear and, and, and see what you did and take heart and also take it as a call to action for future executive overreach. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Yes. I like that. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans, let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258 2412. Online at America's Best Contractors Incorporated.com. In southwestern and south central North Dakota, on any given day at any given moment, a Dakota Community Bank and Trust customer is logging in or signing on to do their online or mobile banking. We believe that community banking can blend both the past with down-home customer service in-house and the future with modern banking conveniences and technology for our customers anywhere, like here or here, all while honoring our long-standing tradition of community-first oriented banking here at Dakota Community Bank and Trust. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even Tide worked out to be pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I, I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running, no matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. Welcome to No Apologies with Becker on Beck, your after hours here oasis. Here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> of sanity. Of sanity. So, next up. I'm very excited about this guest. We are Zooming somebody in tonight. Zoom, zoom. And uh, this individual is not only a fantastic relative, but also <laughs> a hacking expert. So I'm very excited. Yeah. So our next guest is my son, Wyatt, Wyatt Becker. Hey, Dub. Hello. How are you, buddy? Doing well. You look good. Thank you. So, you too. The, Wyatt is supposed to be with us. And uh, unfortunately, two days ago, he found out he had the Rona. And That's so, Rona. Wyatt is not able to be with us on Christmas. I'm very sad about that, but um, we'll do some VR and other stuff. So, we'll have some fun. But here's the thing last week, we were going to talk about a Russian hack. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Um, we didn't have time for it in the segment. 
and we are going to pick it up this week. I had contacted Wyatt with several questions. Um, I'm going to let Wyatt explain what he does because he was able to answer all of my questions and it occurred to me why not just have him as the guest. So, Brilliant. Wyatt. Um, last week there was a big hack. We are told it's from the Russians and we are told that it was very, very extensive. Um, I'm not going to set more groundwork. If you can tell us kind of what happened, a little, a little play by play. Sure. Um, so it's called a, um, a supply chain distribution attack. And what that means is they, they hacked a company that has a lot of clients that they provide a service to. Uh, in this case, it was the Orion update service. Um, but they, they put a payload in there that, when executed, uh, essentially just hacks all of their clients. So from there, it, it was rose. Oh. oh, there you are. Hello? Yep, oh, we got you. there. Go ahead. So there. You're good, man. All right. Did you lose us? I, yeah, keep going, buddy. I can't. All right. So it's a supply chain distribution attack. They uh, embedded a payload in the software. Um, that that payload essentially pushes out a file, which in it's in this case it was called uh, businesslayer.dll, and then that that uh, file lays dormant for two weeks for an incubation period to stay undetected. Um, and it, it's insane how, how sophisticated this tech really was. Uh, there's so many different angles, uh, to which they can take control over network. Um, so the scope of this hat is all of their clients and all of those clients, clients, if you will, oh, wow. um, yeah. And there was so, something like 1,800 clients or something like that. Is that correct? Something around there, yeah. Huge. Um, huge. I would like to ask you a question, Wyatt. Can you tell us exactly what it is that you do? Is oh, you're, yeah. like a, you're a good hacker. I want to hear, hear the backstory of your, your experience. White hat. White a white hat. hat. Yeah, so uh, my company deploys me out to different clients. Um, many times uh, without letting them know. Um, obviously, there's a signed contract beforehand. So they don't know I'm on the premises, and I get to break in and, and hack and steal all their information and all that stuff. And then towards the end of the week, I, uh, uh, I show them everything that I have and how I got it and uh, what's needed for them to fix it. Yeah, it's a, it sounds like an amazing job. It does. It's highly successful. I think it's a penetration tester, a pen tester he goes by. He goes into casinos and state agencies, and he worked on one of the election dealios. So, um, but enough about you, Wyatt. Um, <laughs> so, so here's the thing. There were some very strong statements, and I think we have graphics up on a couple of the statements uh, I'd like to bring up. It's starting to catch a lot of traction, and... Um, uh, Mitt Romney has talked about it. Uh, Mike Pompeo has talked about it. Let's hit that first quote. Um, they are starting to say that this has extensive ramifications. Pompeo uh, said that the damage done is still unclear and may not be known for months as the Department of Homeland Security continues to untangle just how deeply the hack penetrated the computer system systems hacked and what information Russia was able to pilfer. So that... It's do you, do you have any comments on that? Does that sound pretty accurate to you? Yeah, the, this hack can't be understated. Um, I would argue that it, there hasn't been a hack of this magnitude ever. Wow. Um, yeah. The, huh. the amount of information that they would have been able to gather is astounding. Um, for each of those clients that they, they hacked, they were able to read all of their email communications and all of the files that they had, which many times there's a lot of uh, personally identifiable uh, information, pie in the, yeah. Hmm. 
so it like I said, I really don't think it can be understated. It's it's a very significant hack. Interesting. Can you uh, uh, bring up our next quote, please? You know, what's interesting about this, too, yes. is that we really haven't heard a great deal about this in the press. It right. is just being suppressed completely. So Dick Durbin. Yeah. So Durbin says that this is virtually a declaration of war. And, um, yeah, declaration of war on Russia, uh, by Russia on the United States, and we should take it seriously. Now, Wyatt, back last week, um, you had indicated to me, you made a, a statement that I th found very interesting. The seriousness of this, you wondered at what point does cyber warfare necessarily spill over into physical warfare? Is yeah. that some, yeah, it, I mean, because I'm trying to figure out when you have a hack this serious, how do you retaliate? Exactly. Well, yeah, I think that there needs to be a line, you know, that is drawn uh, in the sand. So if someone uh, crosses out, it's war. Um, but we don't have that, and uh, the U.S. has been the punching bag for for foreign hackers for a long time, and uh, there's nothing been done about it. And then, obviously, a hack like this was inevitable. Uh, so hopefully, we'll get some new protocols in place to to have that line. Right, and I understand this hack started like months ago, and then and also you had said something they uh, they use polymorphic code. So that the, the hack or the, the bug or whatever can be changing all the time and, and adapting almost? Yep, yeah. One of many, many uh, measures that were put in place to stay undetected. Hmm. You told me that the Russian group is known as Cozy Bear. Are they, have they done other things? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done a few other things. Um, that I think it's App 29. Uh, yeah, I believe it is. I could be wrong on that, but they're known as Cozy Bear. Uh, interesting fact, though, is that they just recently discovered another malware on the SolarWinds um, servers, I guess, and it also imitated the Orion update service. So it was essentially the same thing as trying to do a supply chain distribution attack, uh, except they didn't, it wasn't digitally signed. So that indicates that it was a different foreign uh, wow. state actor. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, this is, so, this is espionage. And I don't know at what point you have to draw a line in the sand and say, OK, we're going to retaliate in kind or in another way or economically. How do you even retaliate with something like this? It's all new. Yeah. I, I don't know how. I mean, you can retaliate in, in, a, in a cyber way, but I mean, then it's, that's just kind of gamesmanship. I mean, it's almost like you have to do economic sanctions or uh, physically go in, which, I mean, you never want to do. But the damage they can do is as much as, as just taking over your country. Exactly. So, well, why, intellectual property stealing is, I mean, yeah. punishable, I would assume. Well, you sure. Why we've got only a minute left. What um, would be your what would be your final thoughts on the important things to take note here and what we should watch for in the future? Well, I guess a uh, watch for in the future one would be uh, how the U.S. ends up reacting to it because it, like I said, it it there hasn't been a hack of this magnitude before. Um, the amount of information that has been leaked or potentially leaked is astounding and for all we know they uh, gain persistent access to all these so that there's multiple ways in that are undetectable um, I guess legislation won't have a line that's that's basically it that's all you can do other than uh, try to firm up your cybersecurity stand well wow. well I, I am anticipating there's going to be fallout from this for a long time we may have you back on because I have a feeling there's going to be an, a web to untangle that will go on and on and on. Thanks for joining us, buddy. I'm sorry you can't be at home for Christmas, but it's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. All right. Okay. Wow. We are going to be on next, and uh, we're going to be talking about... Brain food. Brain food. We love brain food. Yes, we do. I think you're going to like it today. All right. See you in a couple good. minutes. 
Howdy folks, it's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you're due for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill, at our salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Since opening in Hebron in 1940, Dakota Community Bank and Trust has been your hometown bank. Our mission has been to provide modern banking convenience with old-fashioned hometown service. We've grown with the communities we serve. Through year-round events, countless sponsorships, and nearly 7,000 hours of volunteering each year. Learn more about our 80-year history at dakotacommunitybank.com. Jeez, what a mess. Look at that. There's roof stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans. Let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. For the greatest selection and full menu offering, it's the Four Season Restaurant and Ice Cream Parlor in Garrison. Succulent sandwiches, big breakfast served all day, and delicious desserts. Easy access in and out for campers and RVs. The Four Season Restaurant at the top of Main Street, Garrison. Are you a thrill seeker, sightseer, or day tripper? The Ford Bronco Sport SUV is built for you. Four Bears Casino is giving away a 2021 Ford Bronco Sport loaded with a ton of interior space, safari-style roof, smooth suspension for any terrain, and easy-to-clean surfaces. Qualify now just by playing your favorite slots at Four Bears Casino. Double points on Sundays. Also get in on Super Senior Wednesdays, slot turning Thursdays, and hot seats on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Spin into Four Bears Casino and Lodge for chances to win. things in life are hard. That's why banking shouldn't be. Cornerstone Bank. Welcome back. No apologies on back. It's time for brain food. It is. I always look forward to brain food because it's an educational thing and it really doesn't matter what the brain food is, is, is evidenced by how willy-nilly we go with, with our brain foods. But uh, tonight I would like to start with a little bit about flags and fun with flags. Not to be confused with the Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory fun with flags because that's a completely different thing. He was obsessed with flags. Yeah, okay. So um, anybody who's seen that, yeah, he was really into flags. So I uh, am a big fan of our American flag. And so in August, I took this picture from the South Lawn of the White House. I was obsessed with looking at that flag on the top of the White House. It was just so majestic and it was lit and it was beautiful and so I took this photo when I was there for the president's nomination acceptance speech August 27th and uh, this is so that I can tell you a little tidbit about flags so if you leave it up there I'm going to tell the story so our current 50 star flag was designed as part of a high school project by a 17 year old our current flag was designed by a 17-year-old guy named Robert Heft. It was in 1958, and there were only 48 states at the time. But Heft had a hunch that Hawaii and Alaska would maybe be granted statehood, and so he did it. And his teacher gave him a B minus, um, but went on to um, update the grade to an A after he submitted his design to the actual White House eventually leading to a call, he got a telephone call from President Eisenhower that it had been selected as the official U.S. flag. Uh, his name, Robert Heft, he was 17 years old when he did the design for our current 
flag. Not a lot of people may know about that. I'm a big fan, too, of flag etiquette. I, um, you know, there are some things you may know about, like you, know, you need to have it lit and you need to make sure that it doesn't touch the ground. That's an important thing. I just learned that you were an Eagle Scout moments ago, too. So you are, <laughs> you're a big fan, of course, flag etiquette, because yeah. you do all of that stuff for, yeah. for scouting, and too. Um, I, I, you may know the difference between half-staff and half-mast. What's the difference? I actually don't. Okay, yay! Okay, so yeah. half mast is at sea, half staff is on land. Oh, that's pretty Makes straightforward. Makes perfect yeah. sense, yeah, it does. Hmm. And uh, the other thing is you really should not wear things that are made with flags. Flags are kind of special in that um, clothing should probably, you know, and I have a scarf that has the, the stars and stripes on it. It was all really iffy on wearing it or not because it just is just wrong. The worst one for me is like the chair, the like the camp chairs that are made with the flag logo on them that your bottom goes on. I'm like, that is not cool. So that's uh, fun with flags today. So well, I'm not going to tell you about my camp chairs, but I will tell you <laughs> that um, it is widely known that the young gentleman that that designed the flag. Mm -hmm was uh, overheard telling his teacher to take that B minus and put it in his pipe and smoke it. Um, just a little known factoid. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. He did, they did upgrade it to an A, as it should have been. Well, so. Okay, all right. All right, so your brain. Okay, mine. Ice cream. Well, who does not love ice right. cream? Uh, I, there was some ice on the roads the other day. It made me start thinking about ice. So mm -hmm. ice cream. Marco Polo brought it with him from the Far East. It was more of a form of sherbet or sherbet. Do you right. say sherbet or I sherbet? I say sherbet. I used to say sherbet when I was younger, then I looked at the spelling and now I say sherbet. I know, I try and force myself to say sherbet. It's hard. It's like um, poinsettia and poinsettia. Okay. Right? Okay. okay. All right. So um, it became popular in the 17th century. Kings would have it. Of course, there were some limitations, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Roughly simultaneously in England and Italy, it was sort of co-invented. It was uh, isn't Italy gelato? It was creamed ice. <laughs> yeah, well, but it closely related. It still okay. uses cream. Got it. Uh, or at least milk products. So um, kind of coincided. Um, and George Washington. This is the part I wanted to get to. This is why mm -hmm. why talk about ice cream. <laughs> George Washington apparently loved ice cream, and in the summer of 1790, he spent two hundred dollars. That's a lot of money summer. in 1790. I know. Ooh, wow. 1790, 200 bucks on ice cream. And then uh, people that were at his house, like in later years, found two special um, pots for making ice cream. So good old George, loved the ice cream. Probably did not cause him pain in, because since he had wooden teeth. Although I don't know if that's true. I think I, I heard know. it's not. But it's probably not. There you true. go, ice cream. A little, and this is kind of a, a patriotic trend there, too. So I'm going to talk, mm. my next brain food is about. The oldest city in the United States. Many people probably think that it's, they assume that it's Jamestown, Virginia, uh, that is the oldest city, but it's not. I've actually been to the oldest city in the United States, and we'll show a picture here, and I will, I'll, I'll give you a little description of this. Uh, the oldest is St. Augustine. St. Augustine, Florida, the oldest city in the United States. It was originally claimed for Spain by famed explorer Ponce de Leon. Uh, Looking for the fountain. 15, oh, yeah, there. 1513, and the United States took control in 1821. This is a picture of Castillo de San Marcos National Monument there. And my husband and I, oh, then this one is the picture of some beautiful buildings. We did the trolley tour of the city, and there are so many amazing sites in the city. These are my personal pictures from our trip in uh, uh, April of 2019. And this last one is of Magnolia Avenue in St. Augustine, it's absolutely lovely. The trolley went through this canopy of trees with moss hanging from them, and it was just phenomenal. Very historic city. There's a kind of a back alleyway market area with all sorts of vendors in it that is phenomenal for shopping. We just had a fantastic time uh, exploring and learning about St. Augustine. But mm. if you want to go to the oldest city in the United States, it is not Jamestown. It is actually St. Augustine, Florida. So. Very, very interesting city, beautiful, absolutely beautiful, and the architecture and the things to see were just very historic. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Leon. I like the first name, Ponce. <laughs> okay, my second and final topic for brain food, ready yourself, ice vine. Ice it vine, sounds yes, like ice vine. It's German. ice it's German. wine. It's German. Yes, it's German, there you go. You see what's special about those grapes? Wow, they're they, frozen. Uh, yes, indeed, they have ice on them. 
So the thing is that ice wine, ice vine, is a desert, uh, d desert, dessert. <laughs> oh, it's a dessert wine. It's hard to find in the desert since there's <laughs> right. no ice. But it's a dessert wine, and it's produced from grapes that have been frozen while still on the vine. Purposely or accidentally frozen? I can't imagine. Oh, no, imagine. purposely. Oh. It, it can only, it, see, it's more expensive because it's only in climates where you can get a, a proper freeze. freeze before the grapes rot. Wow. And you have to have good amount of labor because they have to pick them immediately. We do this in North Dakota. We can totally freeze our wine here. <laughs> Canada is the world's largest producer, eclipsing all other nations. Germany is second. Ice vine, if you like dessert wines, sweet That's wines, great. Try it. It's a tasty treat. Brain food. And next, we're going to talk COVID again. A little different angle on COVID this time. Come back. Howdy, folks. It's the Caneline Cafe. I reckon it's time you're due for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at a salad bar. Sink your teeth into our famous Caneline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a comroll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink for trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. My wife was diagnosed with uh, early stage Alzheimer's. We talked about it and we kind of decided we'd be a little bit proactive and try to start making provisions. So we started looking here and uh, even title worked out to be pretty much the perfect answer. I guess I, I didn't expect it to be so nice. The staff here were terrific. We enjoy it. They say when the going gets tough, the tough get going. At OK Tire, we're here to keep you going. From Firestone tires and replacements to retreads and even Firestone tracks, we have you covered. Our certified Firestone experts are ready to get you back up and running, no matter if you're on site or in the field, saving you time and money. OK Tire, we keep the tough going. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. Hey, we're back, and we are at, is at, mm, at least as excited. <laughs> I'm so excited as you I can't are even talk. <laughs> to be here. I'm so excited. Well, this is a this is an interesting topic. Well, we just got some huge fun breaking news, news, big news, which is why I'm just all for clamped here. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we, our topic tonight was the COVID relief package, and we were just talking about that, and we just got the word. Yeah, that Trump said no, sending it back, veto. Isn't Vito, that, baby. that's amazing. That's interesting. There were so many things in this bill. Yeah, so. It's amazing um, and, and wonderful for the reasons that he sent it back. So let's let's talk about it. Let's let's okay. tee it up a little bit. Okay. We're talking the COVID relief package, right. which would be the second largest federal stimulus package ever mm -hmm. after only the one we had in March, which was $2 trillion. This one was for $900 billion. It's crazy. So we're, 
Okay, so let me give you some stats on this too. $600 checks going to individuals making less than $75,000 a year or couples making less than $150,000 a year. Similar to the CARES Act, the size of the payment will decrease uh, for individuals who make between $75,000 and $100,000 and individuals who made $100,000 or more would not receive checks. Dependents would be receiving $600 this time rather than $500. So it's even bigger than it was before. Yeah. Massive, massive economic relief package. Yeah. It, uh, it included so many things. One of them, it, in, it extended the eviction moratorium. Right. Which a lot of people say, yay, people can't be evicted. But you have to understand there's always two sides of the equation. You there could are also some be people. A, you could be a renter. You mean like the, the rentee and then the renter. Right. Well, right. You could. You can be a landlord? an average Joe landlord. You're trying to make a living. You're trying to bring a little income in by having a little rental property. Mm -hmm. And then you have a jackwad who's destroying your property. You can't evict them. Exactly. Or, or if they haven't paid you for a year. I mean, how it, the eviction, I don't like that. But my, anyway. favorite, my favorite pork on this whole thing was the $15 billion for theater operators and small venue owners um, to save our stages art. Yeah. yeah. Now, to be fair, they're working people too, but that just seemed a little frivolous to me to save theaters. That's a nod to Hollywood. I'm, I'm just guessing. Right. Yeah. Well, and th there's a second round of PPP. Right. And uh, as much as a lot of the industry, hospitality industry needs it, I mean, it's time to, to recognize right. that there are needs now, but you can't chain future generations to your largesse or your generosity as a politician now. And that's what is happening here. Precisely. Now, this was just voted on on Sunday, uh, I believe. They brought it forward and they, they passed it. And just in case people are curious, you want to tell them how our contingent, in so, our congressional contingent. So Congressman Armstrong voted no. And I applaud him in that because I did see a tweet from him that indicated that there were, do you know how many pages? Oh, it was, it's ridiculous. It was, like, well, yeah, it was 5, tremendously huge. Pages. Yeah, just huge. And they had like an hour to read it. Right. And so, he, I mean, in my book, that alone is a no vote. Right. You, you can't, I mean, you're going to trust Pelosi to give you a 5,000 page bill and say, yeah, just vote yes yeah. on this? Yeah. Absolutely not. That should be a no vote. Um, the other th reason to vote no is a lot of the crap that was in there, which will bring a little bit of well, that which up is now. why the president threw it back and said nobody no. Right. The third reason to vote no, which is I, I, I hope this is not one of the reasons that Congressman Armstrong considered. A third reason to vote no is that it was going to pass anyway in a Democrat-controlled Congress. It's a safe vote to vote no. Um, you know, they, politicians do that a lot. I am going to believe that... that he had um, the good intentions there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that Arm, Kelly Armstrong voted no for the good reasons, which was you didn't, don't have a clue what's in there, and the little bit you do know, there is a lot of bad stuff in that bill. Now, our two senators, Hoven and Kramer, voted yes. I would, I would love to be able to ask them how it is with so much bad stuff in there that's in the bill, plus the aspect of how we're chaining future generations to going into debt further to provide this money. We're just a printing press that the future generations have to pay. How do you balance that versus people getting $600 stimulus checks? $75,000, you get 600 bucks. Why? $100,000, you get like 100 or 200 bucks or whatever it is. Right. I mean, what in the world? Why would you? Uh, there's so much... This is just throwing money at a problem. It's one of the things that government is fantastic at, and it's one of the things that destroys the economy in the future. You pay for this later. This is what Pat Toomey said. Uh, Pat Toomey said, despite the significant reservations I have about some particular features, I think the good outweighs the bad, and it is my, it is my intention at this point to vote for it. That was his rationalization. The good outweighs the bad. Yeah. The bad is tremendously bad, Pat Toomey. So, I, I think yeah. if you take the politics out of it, if you take the optics out of it, because it, you don't want to vote no on something that's going to provide relief to the people, to the citizens of your state that need relief. Right. But when they chain all of that crap to it, I don't know how you can. I just don't understand how you can vote for it. It's, it's your responsibility to explain to your constituents why you had to, you had no choice but to vote no. 
when it's sending aid to Pakistan, when it's throwing tons of money away in all these other avenues, you can explain that and your constitu constituents will understand it. Um, so I, I'd love to know more about the, the two yes votes. Um, but, so President Trump apparently uh, vetoed it. Right. For a couple reasons we heard, one of which was all of the foreign money. Right. Uh, uh, I don't know the details. But he's, you know, but he's really good about making that the line in the sand often right. too. You know, America first. But billions of dollars going to foreign countries. So if this bill is supposed to be helping people at home, why are we sending billions of dollars to foreign countries in this bill? Right. The other thing is he apparently wants, I think, two thousand dollars instead of six hundred. Mm. Wow. Again, uh, I suppose it depends on on how you do this, but just sending out to everybody it seems to me to be an incredible waste of money. Uh, if anything, maybe what it should be is a is a tax deduction I like that for idea. taxes you would have to pay in. Uh, that you I just like. Throw money. They were out. going to do that with the PPP. They were going to allow people to make their PPP tax deductible. I I read at one okay. point. So that is now that made sense to me. That actually made sense, of, like a forgiveness of mm -hmm. the future tax. But we'll see. Democrats had wanted to include sizable aid to state and local governments. An item yes. they well, right they, an item they had to remove from the final yes. compromise alongside Republicans' concessions. So the Republicans then had to give they had to drop the liability shield to protect businesses against right. coronavirus related lawsuits. That's that was a the give and take. Good thing that that got taken out, right? But because all of the money that would have been wasted going to New York and California, the other uh, states that are more powerful than North Dakota would have been tremendous. So so glad. All right. Okay. We've got an, a, a terrific show for you yes. next time on No Apologies. We have for you The Great Reset. We'll talk about The Great Reset and a guest. And a great guest. Yeah, talking about the same sort of thing with economics, too. Join us then. All right. News brings you real people and real news every weekday on KNDB, KNDM, and KRDK. Start your evening with the Dr. Duke Show at 4. Take a fresh look at current events with ladies of another view at 4.30. Go down the road with Joel at 5.30. Watch No Apologies with Becker at 9. Cap off your night with No Filter with Debbie at 10. Beck News. Real people, real news.